Good morning and welcome to This Week. Game changer. A red line for us is we start seeing chemical weapons moving around or being utilized. Chemical weapons in Syria. It's pretty obvious that red line has been crossed. Does that mean military action is next? Plus, the Boston bombing investigation. It is dangerous to the greater community, and we have got to get to the bottom of this right now. Did the interrogation end too soon? Were warning signs missed? Breaking details from the leadership of the House Intelligence Committee in a This Week exclusive. Then... I appreciate my fellow members of the former President's Club. A parade of presidents in Texas. Armageddon at the airports. And everything you ate this evening was personally shot by Wayne LaPierre. We were willing to try anything, so we borrowed one of Michelle's tricks. <laughs> Washington's prom night. It's my favorite event of the year. We've got all the stars, jokes, and glamour from the White House Correspondents' Dinner. This week with George Stephanopoulos starts right now. From ABC News, this week with George Stephanopoulos. Reporting from the museum in Washington, D.C., George Stephanopoulos. Hello again. They call it the nerd prom, that one night every year when politicians and the press pretend to be Hollywood stars, red carpet and all. And Hollywood turned out in more force than ever last night, all to hear the president take some shots at the press. I know CNN has taken some knocks lately, but the fact is I admire their commitment to cover all sides of a story, just in case one of them happens to be accurate. <laughs> and himself. I'm out in California, we're at a fundraiser, we're having a nice time. I happen to mention that Kamala Harris is the best looking attorney general in the country. As you might imagine, I got trouble when I got back home. <laughs> Who knew Eric Holder was so sensitive? <laughs> Conan O'Brien shot right back. It's been several months since you were reelected, sir. So I'm curious, why are you still sending everyone five emails a day asking for more money? You won! Do you have a gambling problem we don't know about? <laughs> and both men honor the Americans who rallied for others after the explosions in Boston and Texas. We've had some difficult days. But even when the days seem darkest, we have seen humanity shine at its brightest. We've seen first responders and National Guardsmen who dashed into danger. And everyday Americans who are opening their homes and their hearts to perfect strangers. The dinner raised scholarship money for young journalists, too, and we'll have much more from the evening ahead. But now we turn to the new questions about intelligence and national security that have been building all week, from Syria to Boston to Russia. And here to discuss the fallout are the chairman of the House Intelligence Committee, Mike Rogers, ranking Democrat Dutch Ruppersberger, fellow committee member Jan Schakowsky, along with Jeffrey Goldberg of The Atlantic Magazine, our own Martha Radisson. Martha, let me begin with you, and let's talk about Syria and, and the admission this week from the administration that they had discovered some evidence of chemical weapons use in Syria. Describe the evidence. Well, I, I think it sounds like pretty strong evidence. They've got hair samples, tissue samples from some of the victims, and there were at least 30 people who died in Aleppo alone that they believe is directly traced to sarin. As they said, in varying degrees of confidence, they believe those deaths were, tr were traced to the nerve agent sarin. What they don't have is the chain of custody. They believe the Assad regime is responsible for the deaths, but they don't know how yet to track that. And of course, we don't really have people on the ground, the UN's not on the ground, to really track that chain of custody for positive proof. So they say the evidence is not conclusive in their mind, that's why they want further investigation several weeks? Which could be really hard to get if you don't really have people on the ground and it dissipates quickly. So I think it could take even longer Let than that Let me bring that to all. the chairman, chairman of the Intelligence Committee, Mike Rogers. You've also, of course, looked at, at a lot of this evidence. Is it conclusive enough for you? Um, it is, and there is also classified information that we have that I think strengthens the case that, in fact, some small amount of chemical weapons have been used over the course of the last two years. Uh, and, and the problem is, you know, the president has laid down the line. He, you know, it can't be a dotted line. It can't be anything other than a red line. And more than just Syria, Iran is paying attention to this. North Korea is paying attention to this. So I think the options aren't huge, but some action needs to be taken. And if you think about the destabilizing impact, right now the chemical weapons have been small in use. If you have a larger use, the refugee and humanitarian crisis that comes from that is huge. But let me ask the other congressman, how do you explain why it was such a small use of chemical weapons, presumably 
uh, President Assad knew that if he used chemical weapons, it would, it would trigger some kind of response. Why use it in such a small, small area? Well, the first thing, it could be tested. We're not sure. But whatever that is, it's, it, it is a red line. You don't kill people with chemical weapons. And it, it's not just about the United States and where we stand. It's about the whole world and those countries around there. I think a key player here, though, is Russia. I think Russia can stand up and make a difference, and they have before. In the last couple, in, within the last month, Russia, I'm sure, went went to Assad and said, "Look, you don't cross this line." And and I and I think at this point, uh, that's where we are. Well, then let me ask you: Do you agree that the line has been crossed and it's conclusive? Well, the president and I appreciate his deliberate approach to to this. Um, you know, we've had a little problem with going to the U.N. with the idea of weapons of mass destruction before, so we certainly want to finish the investigation. But he said it's not an on and off switch, but it, is, it has changed his calculation. And, of course, he's looking into all of the options. But, you know, to, to imply that um, maybe we're not doing enough or we're not doing anything, I think, is also a mistake. But Jeffrey Goldberg, let me bring this to you, because you said you wrote a couple pieces this week saying very clearly the red line has been crossed, the president must act uh, forcefully. And the president has doubled down on this notion several times right. that if, if uh, Syria uses chemical weapons, he will take action. He's kind of put himself in a box. Well, he, he has, except, and, and I did write that, you know, especially because of our experience with Iraq, this has to be excellent intelligence. The chairman says it already is excellent, accurate intelligence, but it's fine for the president to demand extra extra levels of certification, if you will. Um, but no, he has, and this is the problem of, of red lines. And, you know, he hasn't put down a, a red line. He's been fuzzy on Iran, except to say that they shouldn't cross a nuclear threshold. But the Iranians are watching this one very carefully. They believe that he has a red line for their nuclear program, and they're watching how he handles the Syria issue. And every day that goes by where it seems as if there's indecision or seems that there's some level of ambivalence is, is, is the wrong signal to the Iranians, to the North Koreans, to anyone who wants to test the United States. So the States. question is, Martha, what are these options? I think the president's made it pretty clear as well. He's not talking about sending troops. Oh, I, I don't so think what is this talking range about, of escalating options? I, I think you could talk about a no-fly zone or a safe haven. None of that is easy. It sounds great, a safe haven. But that involves taking out anti-aircraft. It involves kinetic action. And it involves a great deal of risk. And I think here you have to remember the comparison with Iraq. President Bush was looking for ways to go into Iraq. President Obama does not want to go into Syria and is looking for ways not to go in there. So I think that's one of the reasons why they're being so cautious here. And military action, I think, you know, is the military always the option? What is the grander strategy here? Does it have to be a military option? That's the answer to that. Yeah. I, you know, it, part of the problem was <clears throat> I think indecision has, has lessened the number of options we have available. So you have al-Qaeda. Uh, in large numbers, in the thousands, who are the best trained, best equipped, uh, and most committed. And these are the, the opposition to the Assad. Well, regime. what they have done <laughs> is to attach them tell, uh, themselves to the secular units. That causes a huge problem for us. And here's the biggest problem, and why, at least our leadership. And this is not about military intervention alone. How often do you get the Arab League actually asking us to show leadership with them to help coordinate their resources? on the ground in Syria. It doesn't happen very often. Why? The conventional weapons, if they get loose from Syria, and there are a bunch of them, uh, is incredibly destabilizing to the Levant, to the Middle East, to Southern Europe. That's why Israel is, is concerned, Jordan is concerned, Turkey is concerned, because th they see that in chaos, if when he falls, you have Hezbollah in the north trying to get their hands on both chemical and conventional weapons. You have al-Qaeda all over the country now, even knocking on uh, Israel's doorstep in the south, uh, also looking to get uh, better equipped through these stockpiles. It is horribly destabilizing. But it, that's why they need to take a leadership role. But it does appear, Congressman, that the Assad regime is uh, perhaps in many ways even stronger than uh, Saddam Hussein's regime at the beginning of, 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 of the invasion. This is a resilient leader who's not going anywhere fast. Well, we hope he goes a lot faster than he is now. Uh, a lot of people are surprised he's lasted this long. I agree with Mike on the issue of the chemical weapons. That is severe. We have to know where they are. And we're very much concerned when Assad eventually falls, 
where these chemical weapons are going to go. Just like in Libya, we had a lot of weapons that went to some bad guys. And it's the same situation here. So, but we have to be together as a team. You know, we can't make decisions because we're concerned about how, how Iran or, or North Korea looks at, at us. We have to, that is an issue, no question. But we're going to do what we need to do. We have unique weapons that no one else has. But you talk about a no-fly zone. It's easy to say it. But Syria is very sophisticated. Libya was not sophisticated. So we have a lot of issues on the table, and we've got to get it right. But I believe very strongly we have to do it as a, as a team. What's the most effective escalation right now? The most effective escalation for the Americans? Yeah. Well, you know, I have to agree with Martha. Safe Haven is a very... Uh, define, document, nine, define, define what a safe, well, haven, safe haven means essentially you're occupying part of another person's country. I mean, let's not let's not kid ourselves. If you're gonna if you're gonna say that this is a safe haven, you mean that you're enforcing a no-fly zone over that haven. You're protecting that means, those. That, that means you have established your sovereignty in somebody else's country. That is not. We can't call that invasion in the Iraq style, but that's a very serious thing. I think obviously that the number one thing for the Americans to do and for for the world community to do is is to make sure that these Al Qaeda forces don't get hold of any of Assad's chemical weapons. That's the, look. The, President Obama has said this. This, President Bush before him has said this, that the ultimate nightmare for the United States and for our allies is the marriage of weapons of mass destruction and al-Qaeda. And in Syria, we're dangerously close to that happening if Syria falls apart and we're not aware of where these chemical weapons are. So we have to stop chemical weapons from being used and we have to stop them from falling into even worse hands. I, I think, can I just say one thing on the, on the pushing that line in the small number uh, or, or the small amount of sarin apparently used. I think that's really pushing that line. That's really testing to see how far he will go. And from I Assad. Think, it's testing from Assad. Assad. And I think the issue of the number of people who have been killed, which is fairly small, is an issue for the administration. We're talking about weapons of mass destruction. This wasn't mass destruction. So I think that's a game Assad is playing that makes it more difficult. And, for and what he would Obama. be hoping, I presume, Congresswoman, is that he tries a few chemical weapons. America and the rest of the world does not respond, and that demoralizes uh, the opposition. How far would you go in supporting more military action in well, Syria? Well, let me say that no country in the region wants boots on the ground. Um, we had King Abdullah come to the United States, and what he was asking for was help with a political solution, which obviously would be the best. Russia is in a position to help to pressure Assad. Um, and, uh, and, I, and I think that he has to go. I don't think there's any question about that. Um, but I, I think that all these options have to be looked at because the day after, the day after Assad, is the day that these chemical weapons could be at risk that if we don't address the growing sectarianism that is, is there and, and help the, the people who are more moderate, um, we could be in bigger, even bigger trouble the day after. I want to move on to another topic, but just to, to sum this all up, am I hearing that all of you believe that more assertive, including military action, has to be taken, but far short of actually putting U.S. troops on the Nobody's ground? Nobody's calling for boots on the ground. That needs to be very, very clear. <clears throat> and remember, when we're talking about safe haven, Equipment with the Arab League goes a long way. That doesn't have to have a U.S. face on it. But what they do need is specialized equipment that can take planes and helicopters out of the air so you can train the Syrian forces that we can vet and train under the rule Mr. of law. Mr. Chairman, let me stick with you and, and move to the issue of the fallout from the Boston Marathon uh, bombings. Are we any closer, any closer, uh, now close to a couple of weeks in, in figuring out this, this key central question, who radicalized these brothers and when? Uh, there are still persons of interest in the United States that uh, the FBI would like to have conversations with. And the big uh, unknown is still that six months, uh, a little over six months, in Russia. Uh, clearly, that is where th they went from the process of radicalization to pro -violence. The older brother. The older brother. And to violence. And there is a lot that we just don't know. And that's why many say, hey, the Russians need to step up to the plate here and provide us better information. I think they have information that would be incredibly helpful that they haven't provided yet. And I think they Why wouldn't they have provided it? Uh, you have to remember the FSB uh, and is in a hostile service to the FBI and the CIA. And there's a cultural problem there between where the Russians are and, and our folks. So they sent a letter, didn't have a lot of information. Uh, and then three extra times after the investigation was closed, they said, hey, can, do you have any more? They wouldn't do it. 
I believe that they have information and had more information that they just weren't willing to provide. One of the things they have provided is uh, these wiretaps of the brother's mother, who she seems to have been a, a key figure, at least in um, encouraging the older brother in his uh, more fervent worship. The, the FBI, listening to those tapes, thought at the time, at least, that it had more to do with internal Russian politics and not so much a threat to the United States of, uh, of America. But I, I don't really agree that we're not any closer because this is one of the most broad investigations that we've seen. Um, all of our um, law enforcement and intelligence community doing a great job in investigating, in um, questioning all the associations. Uh, Alawi, um, the, the, the radical cleric, dead, but still have tape. Ha there's tapes. You know, they're looking at his tapes, right? They're, they're looking at tapes. And then there's personal issues that the uh, that Tamerlan uh, may have had. Um, uh, that, that but when you say you're closer, I mean, to, to, to pick up on what the congressman was saying, this idea that there might have been other persons of interest, do you know of any other people here in the United States who might have been part of this process of radicalizing Tamerlan? This is part of the investigation. This is a domestic investigation, and it's an international investigation. And we're really good at this. The FBI is very good with that, working with our other agencies. Um, there are persons of interest in the United States. We're looking at phone calls before and after the bombing, uh, this type of investigation. But I agree with Mike also. The, the real test of whether he was radicalized or not or where he was radicalized is Russia. And we have to do a lot of investigation in Russia because when he went over to Russia, and then came back, things changed, including his brother, younger brother. But it seems like he was partly radicalized here as well. I mean, this started in 2009 and 2010 when people started talking about a real change in the older brother. Then he went over to Russia, and then clearly something more happened and meeting with extremists and those wiretaps. And you've you got to wonder why they wiretapped the mother to begin with. Look, the tragic fact of the matter is you don't have to go to Russia to be radicalized. You don't have to go to Pakistan or Afghanistan. You could do it right in your bedroom on the internet. We've learned that Osama bin Laden is dead. His work and his ideas are carried on. And we have a very deep problem. No matter, no matter you know, there, there, are, there are people who are being self-radicalized at this moment in the United States of America. And we have to find a way to disrupt that radicalization process. And it's very difficult and, and because I, it's all there on the and, internet. And I want to get to that, but one of the things we've seen, Chairman, is that it wasn't enough for these guys to go to Inspire, to go to the website to learn how to build the bomb. I know the FBI has real suspicions that even with what they found on the internet, they had to have some kind of help to still get those bombs together. Yeah, absolutely. So, and not only that, but in the safe self-radicalization process, you still need outside affirmation. So in every case that we have seen that has led to somebody taking um, an event uh, to, try to, uh, to try to commit an act of violence, there was outside self or affirmation of their intent to commit an act of jihad. I believe that happened in the United States. Now, we, don't, we still have persons of interest that we're, we're working to find and identify and, and have conversations with. I think and you're saying 10 or fewer? I, I, I didn't say that. I didn't, say, I didn't give a number. I do think there are persons of interest. In Russia is where I think they went from, uh, yes, I'm ready for jihad. Here's how you conduct an act of violence with including training. And the scary part there is who else is still out there that, that they also exactly radicalized. Right. And that really right? is exactly. the threat to our country. We call it the lone wolf, and that's just not one person. Stray dogs. Un under the ra un stray dog, okay, but but under <laughs> the radar. And that was a Lockheed in, in, in uh, Yemen who he organized the shoe bomber, the underwear bomber, uh, and, and this is what really concerns us, and this is what we're saying to our public. You know, if, if there's not chatter and we can't get information through our technical intelligence, and we have the best intelligence in the world, in my opinion, uh, then we need the help of the public to let us know when they're in, in this case, the FBI talked to him twice yes. before he went. Uh, before he went to Russia. I guess the big question is, and Congressman, let me bring this question to you, is why uh, there, was no, there were not further interviews after Tamerlan came back from Russia. If there was any kind of a breakdown in the system, that was it. Well, I think we need to, to, to look at that. The, uh, he, the, the older brother, Tamerlan, was on the um, databases, the Tides uh, database, the text database. We had information about them. What, were the dots not uh, all followed? Um, to, to lead to a, a more investigation. I think that's worth looking mm -hmm. at. Do you, do, you, do you blame the FBI for dropping the ball here? I, I, don't I think it's too early to start pointing fingers and blame. Remember, they're right in the middle of an investigation. I, if you look at what they have, did in 2011, 
At the end of the day, they had no derogatory information, including all the databases, all of the databases, in the, including interviews. And at some point, the FBI just doesn't get to investigate uh, Americans or people here who are illegally just because they want to. That is a huge difference. Now, what happened on the, on, could they have done a secondary interview on the way back? There are some questions there if we can improve the system uh, a little bit. However, I, I think it's wrong to blame the FBI in 2011. At the end of the day, they finished this investigation, found no direct, they did the digital uh, footprint search, couldn't find anything. And then they asked the Russians, hey, will you help us? Is there more to this that we missed? Nothing. Did that three, three times. Three times. Yeah. I mean, far, far be it for a journalist to excuse the behavior of a government agency, but you, know, you have hundreds of thousands of people on these watch lists, and you don't have the law enforcement, even if the law enforcement agencies had the constitutional power to investigate uh, the way some people want these suspicions. You don't have the personnel. You can't. You can't watch 740,000 people. I think that's what's on the tides list right, right now. And you're you not know, really you can't watching watch. that area. Well, then I want. I want to wrap this up by fo following up on the issue you raised just a minute ago. If the problem is self-radicalization here at home, that is relatively easy to do. What do we do about it? Well, this is where this is where the Muslim community has to come into play. You know, we've seen in a lot of cases where it's it's moderates in the Muslim community who have. Told, uh, told law enforcement about radicals in their midst. And, 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 you know, you have this brightly lit pathway on the internet toward radicalization for a young, disaffected, alienated Muslim male. There has to be a counter pathway that, that you know, and, and this is not something that the United States can do. This is not something that a Western power can do. This is an issue that's deeply embedded in the civilizational struggle within Islam. And it's not something and that it, the committee can, can fix. And another version of see something, say something, okay? Thank you all very much. Sure. Fantastic discussion. Okay.